Hello, and welcome to the Character and World Building panel. This panel is going to be about what the title says, Character and World Building, usually for writing, for gaming, for uh, like animation, basically any type of media that will involve storytelling using characters and worlds. So let's begin. First of all, hello, I'm Inkros. I am an illustrator, YouTuber, and author who wrote this book. So this is kind of what I'll be using as sort of my example for what I have been doing with characters and world building. And this is... Sean Bellinger, um, lead 3D artist over at a game company in Houston, uh, Six Foot Studios. So uh, I do uh, 3D modeling, 3D animation. Uh, we're working on a game called Dreadnought. Check it out. Uh, we'll be releasing it on Steam in uh, August-ish. Wait, you raised your hand. Have you heard of Dreadnought? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you're my new friend. Yes. <laughs> yes. Cool. Yeah. So you're. It, so it's a. It, I, I'll talk about it a little bit later. But carry on. Okay. Okay. This is my book, Dragon Queen Scarlet Rain. It's about a princess who gets turned into a dragon. So I'm gonna use some of the characters from it as sort of examples later on. So first section is constructing characters. You have some little concept art there of one of my characters. So first is the building blocks of your character's personality. You can start from an archetype, um, like uh, the nerdy one, the quirky one, that sort of thing. And then from there, you add on personality quirks. So maybe are they moody, quirky, and happy, <laughs> giggly, and cute? Maybe they have depression, but they try their best to cheer up their friends kind of like Sayori from uh, Doki Doki Literature Club. It kind of adds a lot of depth to them when you, you can start from an archetype, but you add on a lot of stuff to that in order to give them a lot more depth and make their character perhaps even uh, what you did not expect them to be. Maybe you expected them to be rather shallow, but you realize that there's a lot more to them than meets the eye. And most importantly for a character is to give them motivation. That was good. Thank you. <laughs> So as an example, you have the, t the main three characters from Attack on Titan, um, Eren, Mikasa, and Armin. Now at first glance, they all are kind of archetypy. For example, Mikasa is the quiet, stoic, smart one, and Armin is kind of the nerdy, shy um, one, and Eren is the main character, hot-headed one. But when you get more and more into the show, you start to see uh, more of who they are and more to their character, especially when you start seeing their backstories, like Mikasa's backstory is uh, basically uh, helps a lot with her character and helps you understand her more deeply as a character. Character flaws. My favorite. <laughs> um, no character should be perfect. Are they impatient, a liar, a thief, prideful, ignorant to the impact of their words, they have anger issues. They need to make the wrong decision sometimes. Having a character that only does the right thing and everyone always likes them is sometimes called a Mary Sue. But even if it's not, it can just make for a character that seems rather unrealistic, unrelatable. So when you give your characters um, traits that make them feel more human, even if they're completely non-human, <laughs> it makes them more relatable to the audience. As an example, in the movie Zootopia, both of the characters have uh, flaws, and both of them have prejudices they have to overcome about one another, and those are the flaws that they overcome, and as such, they become good friends by the end. Uh, even if they sort of break up from one another due to their flaws conflicting with one another throughout the movie. Likes and dislikes. Um, Part of what defines a personality are likes and dislikes. Sometimes these things can be even fairly petty. Does give the character definite values and beliefs? Are they religious? Does their religion define their values? Uh, perhaps uh, their likes and dislikes are what TV shows they like in their own little universe, or what books they read. Maybe what they dislike is just a random food object, and that has to do with the story at some point. It's very subtle with some of these little likes and dislikes, but they can give a lot of um, oomph to a character. I was going to jump in. Uh, part of uh, what that does is it adds believability to the characters. Um, if you've ever watched um, any animated show or any TV show and felt like, oh, there's no depth to this character, 
because you're not really uh, drawn into who they are. And adding some of these elements to the characters helps draw the uh, viewer into who they are. You want you want to, you really want the viewer to care about the character. So sometimes having likes and dislikes that may even match up with your own uh, makes them more relatable. So. Mm -hmm. As an example, here's Gwenpool from the Marvel comics. Part of her whole personality is the fact that she's a huge Marvel fan, <laughs> and she loves a whole bunch of Marvel superheroes. So when she ends up being uh, taken and put into the Marvel universe, she uses her knowledge of the comics in order to get out of situations or into situations is that, that are. Kind of break the fourth wall. Kind of she like is. Cool. She's from yeah. the real world. Like yeah, her whole character cool. is that she's from the real world and she's a Marvel fan, and she gets put into the Marvel universe. Nice. So she knows everyone's secret identities, and she uses that to her advantage. <laughs> knowledge is a superpower. Exactly. That's her. She says that I think in the. <laughs> she knows everything. And next is a character's backstory. Giving them backstory can depend on what your goal with the character is. Are they a tragic character? In that case, you give them a tragic backstory. Are they silly, sheltered, innocent, or spoiled? Backstories give the writer a chance to show how a character became the way they are and how their personalities were formed. That last sentence is incredibly important because uh, if you want that character to show that perhaps they had changed in some way, a backstory is a great way to show that. Or if you're trying to have a character who maybe was broken in some way and throughout the show you're trying to fix them and help them become a better person, their backstory can show how they were perhaps broken. That's actually well said. Um, that really helps with the journey of the character going, moving from uh, one trait to another, maybe they're, like I said, overcoming an issue, or maybe they're evil and want to become good, or maybe they're a liar, or they've done something really bad in their past. Mm -hmm. Gives them the chance to redeem themselves with a yeah. nice, healthy backstory. Exactly. As an example, you have Raven from Teen Titans, who is literally the daughter of a demon lord. And that's part of her backstory, is that she's trying to overcome that and help stop her father from ending the world. And then there's Jason Todd. Um, the Red Hood's backstory is that he used to be one of the Robins, and then he got brutally murdered by the Joker. And then when he was resurrected, he turned into the Red Hood. And because of his backstory, that became his motivation for how he was as the Red Hood. Basically, his, his uh, whole thing as the Red Hood is that he kills villains, while Batman does not, because he was killed by a villain because Batman never killed the Joker. So that's kind of the whole morality clash, and the whole reason he's like that is because of his backstory and the fact that he was killed. And next is character relationships. Relationships with other characters are a big way to help define your own character. When seeing another character, how do they react, and what do they say, what do they do? How do they interact with each other? That says a lot about who we are as people, because we're not a single entities. We are entities that are made to communicate and be a part of groups and communities. So the way we interact in those communities help define who we are as characters. Are they relaxed around a person, nervous, terrified, content? That's all a big part of who they are. And I got nothing to say. <laughs> you, you did well with that one. Okay. Nothing at all. And then a good example is the characters from Uncharted series. The way they interact with one another is a huge part of why people like the game. The way the character relationships build with one another, the way they slyly and sarcastically re uh, remark to one another, um, it all helps build relationships which builds their characters. You couldn't imagine Nathan Drake just alone throughout the entire game. If he didn't have Sully to bounce off of or Elena, it wouldn't be as nearly of engaging of a character set. Facial expressions, I don't hear people talk about this one super often, but I think it's a really important part of characterizing a, a character. This is, of course, very specific to um, either animation, comics, anything that could show in expression books. You can sort of do this, but it has to use, of course, with descriptions. Um, in artwork, comics, and movies, and animation, and even writing, they're key to conveying character. And how do they physically react to a given, given situation? Body language also is part of it. So it's not just their face at times, it's also their body language. You'll see a lot of this in um, the, the concept art and works that you see in, from TV shows, movies, animation, whatever. And they will do sheets and sheets of expressions, expression sheets. So 
that any type of emotion that needs to be generated by the by the character can be listed on that sheet so the artists or animators can pull from that and, and uh, bring those uh, expressions uh, to life. So you'll see a lot of that as gamers, I assume you guys are gamers, um, you, you've probably seen some of that yourself in, in some of the behind the scenes work in some of these games and movies, but this is hugely important. It's not there just to uh, just to show off some cool work, it's vital to bring those characters to life. So when you see uh, uh, the characters in, in Uncharted, those facial expressions, they're not, just, they're not just sitting there thinking about that on the fly. All of that is generated in a sheet that then is called whenever an expression is needed. So. And a good example of this is the TF2 comics. Um, the, whoever does the art for this, uh, she's an amazing artist. She does a lot of different beautiful facial expressions that are able to convey character incredibly well. Of course, along with the very well-written dialogue. Of course. <laughs> And it ends up just becoming a really fun thing to look through. My friends and I end up using a lot of the expressions for, for icons on Skype or our Discord. Just because they're so, especially out of context, they're so hilarious just to look at. And they characterize a lot of the um, characters very well. Character design. When a person first glances at a character, they should be able to get a good sense of who that character is. Um, clothes, weapons, hairstyle, posing, body language, species, body structure, they all relate to this. This is huge. Um, character design is important because you guys all look at, uh, you can look at the silhouette of a character like Mario and instantly know that that's Mario, right? So when you're designing characters, and, and this even comes back to ship design for, for Dreadnought, silhouette is everything. The character is important. So you'll find that a lot of concept artists will do multiple uh, uh, thumbnail sketches of a character. Uh, a character artist like Ink Rose here would do multiple thumbnails of a character to get the, uh, the silhouette down so that it's readable. Instantly readable characters is, is, is important because then as the consumers looking at those, they can instantly relate or recall that character for a game or a movie or whatever. So design is important. Um, silhouette is the, the, the probably the most important part of that because it's, it's what's readable instantly. Mm -hmm. Like on a character like this, if you made it a silhouette, you would immediately see the wings as well as some of the tail and the like paws on her legs. So it immediately um, characterizes her. And of course, Overwatch is one of the more iconic examples these days. When you look at any of these characters, you immediately get a very good sense of who they are. And even if there were silhouettes, you could see Symmetra's hands doing their delicate motions to do the hard light structures. So you would see that and you would know it's her because that's the way she uses her hands. And of course, Mercy's wings are a big part of that as well. Um, if you see like some recent games that haven't been like super successful, I think Lawbreakers it had an unfortunate case of not having really recognizable character design. So what you want to do is do something like Overwatch, which is recognizable immediately, good character design, good silhouette usage, good uses of color especially. Use a lot of color normally. It depends on the type of game, but it's a good idea to use a lot of color if necessary, especially if you can color code the characters, because that will lead to people being able to recognize them more easily. And what you'll find in, in uh, many of those games is that you'll have concept artists who are creating these sketches, but a lot of the decisions are made by uh, kind of by committee. So you've got a group of people that get their eyes on it. So if you were to do it as an individual, uh, one of the things I would suggest, and this is something I do even when I'm doing my own work, is have someone else's eyes look at it. Is this readable? Does it make sense? Does it look? Cool. I mean, there's sometimes a cool factor or an appeal factor for uh, for characters. So those those are important when it comes to designing characters. And character development. Main characters must grow and change in some way over the course of the story. Static characters are unrelatable and boring. <laughs> of course, this also kind of depends on what medium you're going for. If it's like a silly cartoon that's only one minute or two, then you don't really need like a lot of character development if it's just like a little comedy cartoon. But with stuff that's like long form stories or books, even short form, uh, character development is a big plus for your story.
And this can even apply to their design. It can change over the course of the story. And you can also alter the character's design over real world time in order to make it better, essentially retconning the design. That first one was how I designed that character in 2016. And that one is design of the character two years later. So her design got completely updated and I retconned it for the story because uh, I wanted to basically change the art style for the story. And a good example of this is Link from Legend of Zelda. Not only does he change art styles throughout the different games, but throughout each game he changes usually from a farmer or island boy into a fierce warrior uh, wielding the Triforce of Courage. And the, the most literal change is literally him turning into a wolf at one point. But the most symbolic one is, well, the most iconic is um, Child Link to Adult Link and him changing to become a hero to save Hyrule. Now on to the next section, Building Worlds. Time period and location. This is one of the biggest factors influencing your story and world. Is it set in medieval times? Is it in the future, the Stone Age? Is it even on Earth? Maybe it takes place in a fantasy world or in space, perhaps another universe altogether. If it is a world separate from ours, what kind of time period is it in? These are uh, really big things that factor into your story because it, uh, it also changes some of the language usage. It changes uh, aesthetics and so especially. As an example, World of Warcraft it has a very graspable setting. It's a, a world all of its own, not on Earth, that is a fantasy-inspired, very, very high fantasy type of thing that is kind of one of the pillar stones of high fantasy of today's um, nerd culture. <laughs> one of the things that's really cool about world building, uh, especially with dealing with uh, time and location, is that you've got some flexibility in uh, creating your world. So. Um, we recognize the world around us, so if we're doing something that's uh, in our world, then everything has to be recognizable. We have to hit those cues, and if we don't get it quite right, then it's like, uh, we, you know, that's not quite right. But if it's fantasy, then if it's another world, then the rules change. Does it have gravity? I don't know. We don't have to have gravity. We can have floating rocks. I don't, you know. So those elements. Um, uh, come into play because you have flexibility in your, in your storytelling. So, And your world's inhabitants. What kind of sentient beings roam your world? Are they simply humans or are they other creatures like aliens or fantasy races? How many species of sentient beings are there? Are all the animals normal earth critters or are they magical? Are they enhanced by technology? Are they cyborg creatures? Robotic creatures? So. That's a huge part of world building because the different races of your world have a huge impact on not only how a person, like it depends, and maybe if you have a game like World of Warcraft, if you have different races, maybe they have different gameplay aspects. They have different aesthetic aspects. Maybe they can wear certain type, kinds of armor that others can't. Can they do certain decorative features on their horns that, other, that humans couldn't? It's a fun part of designing uh, characters. And it goes hand in hand with character design because your characters will be in one of these different species types and you can use that to characterize them in their own way. As, for example, if you have a character who's an orc, you already have a sort of stereotyped set of uh, character flaws and um, stereotypes that you can use to build off of. Or it could be a complete break of stereotype and that can be part of the character as well, being um, something different than what people think they are. This is actually one of my favorite parts of uh, uh, developing a, a fantasy world or you know, sci-fi world for a character because the environment has to show that it's been affected by the inhabitants, right? And I, I see that missing sometimes um, in, in games and even in shows, it's like, what we want to see is how people or creatures or the races impact the environment. And you have different races, they might impact the, the environment in different ways. So one race might be, uh, they might utilize the resources more often, like you know, using up the resources in, in the environment. Or you might have another race that is uh, respectful of it. 
you will see instances or, or the result of that in, uh, in, in when you're developing a good world um, that shows that there's uh, inhabitants uh, living in it. So those are things to consider as well, well when you're world building. As a very good example, there's the races in Mass Effect trilogy. Uh, the Asari, Salarians, Turians, all of them have different cultures, different anatomy, uh, they even live different lengths of time. The Asari can live for thousands of years while the Salarians usually live to like 50 or 60, or maybe even less than that. Um, so because of that, Salarians talk faster because they are on sort of an increased time scale. Um, so you can use that to characterize them or give them different physical aspects that uh, relate to their characters, relate to how they interact with the world. Salarians go fast because they have such short lifespans. So they think everyone else around them seems rather slow and slow-witted. So they're very quick-witted and they're very smart. And Turians are based on Romans. So they are a very warlike and organized race. So you see that in the way they interact with people, you see that in the way they fight, and the way they are characterized. So it's a bit, it goes a long way into helping your world seem diverse and interesting, and having a lot of different cultures you're able to explore, and thus make it just a more interesting world to explore in the first place. What kind of environment does your story take place in? A high-tech city, an enchanted forest? This has to do with your setting, but in this case, we're getting even more specific. If it's not on Earth, is the planet mainly desert, like Tatooine? Is it mainly rainforest? Try to sketch out a map of the city or country or continent where your characters will be traveling. It's not a must, but it's a good idea if you want to help visualize exactly what will be where. Where are going to be the northern mountains that might be covered in snow? Where are the valleys that are grassy? Where's the deserts? Where's the oceans? The oceans and rivers usually help say where cities are going to be because that's usually where high trade, route, trade routes are. This is uh, uh, something that uh, we take into consideration as well when we're working on our game, uh, Dreadnought. Um, now it's more about the ships in that game, but um, sometimes environment is important. Um, in fact, we have one map that we're working on right now that uh, is more interactive uh, with the ships, and um, it has to have a backstory. It has to show that there's an influence um, by the uh, influence by the, uh, the the players or the, the the captains of the ships, you know. How, and it's uh, showing um, the different areas is important because it, it helps with locating, you know, strategic. Um, spots to, to, to set up to uh, take out your enemies. So um, it is helpful to have uh, a nice diagram when you're starting to develop so you know what spots are going to be uh, hot spots for battle or for um, a character's uh, maybe, um, you know, building a fort or, you know, setting up shop. I mean, however you want to do that, you have to have all that mapped out when you're setting up your environments. An example is Skyrim. Even though the whole continent of Skyrim is uh, based on, you know, north, northern areas, it has different parts of Skyrim be uh, have slightly different environments. Like um, maybe in the central part of Skyrim, it's a grassland, and in some of the northern parts, in the mountainous parts, there's lots and lots of snow and pine trees. So you can just use that to help have a differing sorts of climates and as such there might be different creatures there depending. Culture and religion. What sort of cultures are your world's inhabitants a part of? How do their cultural values reflect on their life and laws? What's the dominating religion? Are there any cults offshooting from said religion? Like in Skyrim there's different uh, Daedric lords and each kind of has a different following or different uh, cults or offshoots from the following and as such uh, they are, they have like different types of magic and uh, stuff like that. Um, what cultures are at odds with one another? What sort of politics does each culture lean towards? Make sure your cultures have holidays and religions, <laughs> like Star Wars has Life Day. <laughs> um, make sure that um, fashion styles and architecture are super important for world design. After all, you cannot imagine World of Warcraft without like the beautiful elven structures or uh, the stormwind uh, from the humans. 
So those are a big part of defining your cultures, especially for each species, so definitely keep that in mind. An example is Lord of the Rings. Um, when you think about the Shire and how it's different from where the elves live or the dwarves, you can see that there's a different cultural impact and each kind of have different lore and legends. Uh, and the dwarves, like they, in The Hobbit, they had the big stone that was basically what, they, what the king would have of the dwarves. He, would ser sought, he sought after it and uh, that was kind of his mark of kingship. Um, and when the, mount, when the mountain was taken from them by Smaug, it was kind of their uh, group, their cultural um, story to tell one another about how that mountain fell and to try to take it back. It was part of their pride. So that's a big part of culture is storytelling. And one thing that's important um, when you are world, world building and you've got different cultures in the environment, um, not only are you going to have unique cultures um, in different areas, um, but you also have to think about or consider how those cultures blend and how they interact and how they both affect the environment, how they both affect uh, uh, their, their religious and, and cultural differences um, and how they connect. Uh, so it's not, again, you don't want these all, these, these races, these cultures to operate in a silo. You don't want them to, to be isolated uh, from each other. Uh, when you're trying to tell a story that blends all of them together. So uh, those are considerations taken take into account as well. And history and war. Uh, come up with an origin story for your world and or how your world got to be in its current state. Like in Mass Effect, um, it used to be just like normal Earth until we discovered Prothean technology on, I believe it was Mars, and then suddenly aliens exist and we uh, have a war with the Turians when they first have first contact because of a misunderstanding of galactic law that we didn't know at the time. So that was a great way of getting stuff kick-started in the universe because uh, especially when you already have regular Earth as a background that can make it kind of easy. Just It was Earth but then something happened. <laughs> so that makes it a little bit easy but there is also fantasy worlds that have their own uh, origin stories, world building, that kind of thing. Wars are huge touchstones in history because they usually, with it, have surges in technology. So those can be uh, pretty big touchstones for certain parts. Um, the world should have a fairly detailed history, maybe even a definite timeline, depending on the complexity of what you're going for. Uh, like I said, their great book marks in history and alter the future of your world. What's really cool about this too, and it, I'm glad you mentioned wars. I mean, in some games, you'll find that uh, that uh, wars advancing technology. You'll find that some of that sometimes that happens with the inhabitants incorporating not only technology to use, but maybe technology into themselves. So wars can also change the culture of of, of a people, or even change their appearance uh, in order to advance themselves or to become. Uh, better at uh, waging war. So. Mm -hmm. And of course, Fallout is a great example of this. Uh, basically, uh, people, it was normal Earth until the 50s. And then that's when like, uh, people were using a bunch of nuclear technology for pretty much anything, everything because the world was running out of resources at a, as a, at a rapid rate. As such, the Cold War like, never really ended. It became a real war. Uh, the resource war, especially with China, and that was how the bombs fell, and that's how Fallout comes to be. And Fallout has a lot of lore. For the open world games, they have a lot of missions and quests and things where you learn a lot about different parts of these segments of the wasteland. Uh, so Fallout's a really good example of a war completely changing the landscape of the land, and even then, after Fallout, there's even more little wars that go about between different factions in the world, such as the Brotherhood of Steel. So those help to define the world and the history as it goes along. There's a definite timeline when it comes to fallout, and there's 200 years after the bombs fall that have lots of little bookmarks of history inside them. Naming conventions. Depending on the language, time period, and culture of your people, the naming conventions should follow suit. Names of cities, religions, people, cultures, and creatures and countries alike should generally be based in their culture. Pretty self-explanatory. Like if you're in an 1800s setting 
and your people are saying yo to each other. I mean, you could do that, I guess, <laughs> but it's not considered good form. It's really, really <laughs>